Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can see the live stream on Slido. It seems to work. Um, I don't see why I don't get it on my phone, though. That's a bit discomforting. Can someone tell me in the in the back channel whether you can see the uh, live stream there? Okay, almost there. Let me ask this directly. Okay, seems to work fine. Whatever's wrong on my phone is uh, than just the phone. All right. Good. Sorry for the um, delayed start. Um, things are sometimes weird. But good that it seems to work. Um, so welcome back to a, uh, another session of COM5 to 6. Um, almost, almost ready to go. Uh, before we get started today, um, I want you to think about the, the video presentation groups. And um, in particular, everyone should now have a group that they're assigned to. I have um, put all people who haven't signed up already in a group. Uh, there were a few people who joined a bit late on the confirm uh, engagement task. But uh, I think by now everyone's settled. So the groups should be stable and you should be able to start looking for the videos like uh, half of you have done. Uh, maybe I should have asked if you have already found an article, but uh, you have uh, another week or so for that. So uh, no need to hurry. Um, the second announcement I wanted to make is about the class test. You probably saw the double posting on the uh, announcements, both on, on Campus Wire and on, um, on Canvas. Uh, so the, it's a quiz on Canvas that you have to fill out. There's two quizzes, actually. One is a practice quiz that doesn't count at all. You can just play with it and see what the type of questions are. And then once you feel you're able to do this, I, th I, th I think most of you will be able to do this after a very short time of practicing. You can attempt the, the actual class test. And then you have uh, one more of these types of questions. And you have to fill it in, and then it counts. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty quick. Just one question. I decided to keep these very short and uh, um, restricted to the, uh, the, the bare essentials. Um, the idea was just to have some of the weight of the exam spread out. And uh, I think that overall should make it easier for you. Okay, um, with that, let's uh, continue our topic on sorting. Uh, just to remind you a little bit from last time, we talked about uh, two classic sorting algorithms. Um, just to get you up to speed, to remind you what sorting is like, and uh, also to introduce these uh, gems of algorithms. We talked about merge sort, we talked about quick sort, and we talked a little bit about their pros and cons. Um, and uh, for most of you, this will have been a recap of what you already know. 
Um, but again, I, I was trying to stress um, some more advanced comments on this. I want now to move on to the second part of, this, of the sorting unit. In this next subsection, I want to talk about a lower bound. That is a provable guarantee that no algorithm in a certain class of algorithms uh, can ever uh, perform better than a certain, a certain bound, a certain um, um, minimal barrier that we cannot get breakthrough. And that's one of the, the core features in, in algorithm theory that you're not only able to construct and, and engineer algorithms that are useful to solve problems in practice, but also you can show often very rigorously uh, what their limits are. And this is, uh, this is the goal of this section, to show on, an ex on a simple example, namely the, uh, the world of sorting, how such a lower bound proof can look like and um, also what we can do about it. With that, uh, let's get started on the comparison-based model. Again, I think this topic is something that many of you will have seen, but maybe not quite from the rigorous perspective. Uh, so let's um, spend some time on this. A lower bound is a mathematical proof that no algorithm can do better. So it's, it's essentially a statement about all algorithms. And these are very hard to prove. If you remember from the proof techniques, this is a statement that is all quantified over all algorithms. It's a very powerful concept uh, because it's an impossibility result um, that is proven um, rigorously mathematically. So there's no, no wriggle way, there's no, um, no way to discuss uh, with this. I'd like to compare it with conservation of energy principles in physics, uh, but it's usually much stronger. I mentioned this before, usually we can prove stronger lower bound than what uh, the fundamental limits in, in physics mean for machines. Usually our, I don't know, uh, combustion machines reach limits much earlier than uh, the conservation of energy would predict. In computer science, we're often much closer in that uh, we can, for many problems, um, achieve something that is at least asymptotically the same as the lower bound. We find an algorithm that has the cost predicted by the lower bound up to constant factors and up to the fact that we have to do uh, to restrict our attention to large inputs. Um, but uh, subject to these restrictions, these are optimal algorithms. I'm not the greatest fan of using this term here because optimal can mean many different things for different people. Uh, but it's a useful, a useful concept to, uh, well, to sell your, your results probably. Uh, that's what it is, <laughs> what it's most useful for. Uh, as I said, it's a statement about al all algorithms. So we must precisely capture what this means. What is all algorithms? We already know one, one way to do it. Any formal model of, mod of computation is suitable to do this. Any formal model of computation of computers defines a class of algorithms. But it turns out that the RAM model is uh, fairly powerful. And so it's hard to prove lower bounds for it. It's not impossible and people do this. This is an active uh, field of research. Um, but for, for today and for here, we want to look at a more restricted model where the lower bound proofs are simpler. And this restricted model is the comparison model. Um, sometimes the people don't make this very explicit. So I want to make this very, very explicit. It is a model of computation. It is a model of a computer that you can have in your mind but we cannot really build this type of computer. It's a, a purely theoretical abstraction, but one that will be essential in the proof and what follows in the next subsection. So it's a, don't, don't mistake this as a blueprint to build the next generation of uh, Pentium whatever or Intel Core I whatsoever. Uh, this is a, a mathematical abstraction. So our machine is a, is a box and we have 
a large array of elements that we uh, try to sort in our case, but the comparison model doesn't care much. It's, uh, you can work with these elements in any way you like. Um, and uh, essentially this, this array is filled with objects of different sizes. And the algorithm has a, the, the machine has a, a, a balance where you can put two elements and uh, you can compare them. And the outcome is, is either less, equal, or greater. And that's all you can really know about the elements that you're uh, working with. They're, they don't have colors. There are not numbers that you can divide. The abstraction here is the only thing you know and the only thing you can do with these elements is compare them. If you have to, you can say which one is smaller, which one is, which one is um, bigger. The other thing is you can um, move elements around so you can decide to swap two elements and then you just uh, exchange them in the array. So uh, we can do comparisons. We can do swaps. And uh, pretty much that's it. It's a very simple model of computation. As I said, it's overly restrictive. You wouldn't be able to do much beyond sorting with it. A few other related problems. But that's not the point. The point is to have a simple model that captures the essence of the sorting problem and then proof lower bounds. Uh, so let's, let's continue with this. It makes very few assumptions um, very few assumptions on the objects that we're sorting. As I said, you can only compare some, only compare them, which is uh, weird if you want to program with it. Well, not too weird because merge sort and quick sort actually uh, just use the element in that way. But this is what makes the model uh, helpful for lower bounds um, because it's it's fairly general. It doesn't make many assumptions. That means it applies to many different things. And um, what makes this, this problem, uh, this, this model, nice for, um, for analyzing it is that every algorithm can be represented um, by a single uh, relatively easy to understand object, and that's the so-called decision tree. Now this is, um, is this an, a tree? And I will, I will show an example on the next slide in a, in a second, but uh, I want to briefly explain what it looks like. We only model the comparisons that our algorithm does. So remember, one decision tree means one algorithm. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these. Um, and uh, so we model only the comparisons we ignore the data movement. The actual algorithm has to swap elements around. The decision tree completely ignores this. The nodes in the decision tree are the actual comparisons that the algorithm does. And this could mean, uh, it could say we compare the element at position 17 with the element at position 42. And uh, that can have a couple of different outcomes, smaller, equal, or greater. And that's what a single node in the comparison tree uh, encodes. And then um, the next comparison that the algorithm does after these can depend on what was the outcome. So if this is your node, you can have different outcomes, less, equal, greater. and uh, the next comparison is here in these child nodes. And that comparison can depend on what that comparison gave as a result. All right. Uh, and if you continue doing this, you eventually reach a leaf node that doesn't have any further children. And these leaf nodes correspond to an input permutation. So one important aspect of this model is because we don't assume anything about the objects that we are given. All that is really relevant is to learn which of the objects is the smallest, what's the second smallest, what's the third smallest. In other words, what is the order of these objects in sorted order? How would I have to rearrange them? 
And learning this permutation is what uh, decision trees encode. If you restrict yourself to permutations, that implicitly means we will never use this uh, equal branch because permutations imply that all elements are distinct. That's a, a minor assumption here that makes life a little cleaner, but it's not a, a vital restriction. Uh, you can extend the comparison model to handle these cases as well. So here's a, an example of a comparison tree. As promised, this is again a specific algorithm on inputs of size three to not make it too big. This six different permutations of the numbers want of, of, of three objects. And uh, because we don't assume anything about the objects, we might as well take the integers one up through n. We just are not allowed to make use of that knowledge. So if we start out, the algorithm doesn't know anything. And any of these six permutations uh, is, is possible to be the permutation that the input is in. Now the algorithm decides to first compare the, the first and the second position in the array. And if the first position is smaller, it decides to make another comparison, namely the second and third. So remember, we start at zero. So uh, if we follow this left branch, if the input is such that both of these comparisons turn out as less, then the input must have been already in sorted order. That's one of the possible outcomes. And you see, um, whenever you do a comparison, there's a certain number of uh, permutations that are currently compatible with your state of, of knowledge, what you currently have learned about the input. And then adding the next comparison splits this set of permutations into two parts. And uh, as soon as that part is a single permutation, you have learned the exact order of the input. And that's all we need for sorting. You could then just uh, move all the elements around to apply the inverse permutation, and then the input is sorted. I hope this example makes it um, a little more clear what these comparison trees look like. And uh, remember, you have a different comparison tree for every input size. Now, what can we say about these trees? Um, if we execute the algorithm on a specific input, so maybe this is something um, to note here. One comparison tree. Corresponds to one algorithm. And uh, one input size, one n. All right. If I now, if I now were to execute this algorithm on an input of that size, I get a single execution. And that's what this is talking about. Um, so one execution means following one path in this comparison tree. And uh, the uh, leaf that I reach encodes the input permutation. On every step I do, um, in every node that I pass through, I do one comparison. So that means the length of this execution path is the cost of that execution. And the height of the comparison tree is the longest such path. So that's the worst case number of comparisons. OK. So uh, in our case, the height of this tree is, we defined it as the number of edges, one, two, three. Uh, and that's also the number of comparisons that this algorithm does in the worst case. Any of these inputs is the worst case where you do three comparisons. Uh, next observation is comparison trees are binary trees in this, in this model where the outcome is, uh, is one of two things. And that means, remember, uh, we talked about this when we discussed binary heaps, even if we make all the levels full from the pop, uh, we do need that many levels to get to a certain number of nodes. So if we have L leaves at the bottom, uh, it turns out we need a height that is log of L rounded up. And finally, the last 
Last observation is if you want a comparison tree for sorting, then you need all these, uh, all the permutations that are possible for an input to be in as leaves. That is n factorial leaves. And so uh, the height is this um, log of n factorial, which is asymptotically equivalent to n log n. Okay. So uh, wrapping up, any decision tree, start a step before that, any comparison, any comparison based sorting algorithm corresponds to one decision tree per input size. Any such decision tree for a size n has to have n factorial leaves and it has to have size um, height, I'm sorry, height at least uh, log of that, which is n log n up to lower order terms. So the height of this comparison tree must be n log n. And uh, the height of the comparison tree is the worst case number of comparisons of that algorithm. So what we've proven is uh, that this um, second part here, um, so that's, that's not what I wanted to say. I haven't written down the, the statement of the lower bound, um, which maybe we should. So uh, this, is, this is the conclusion from these two things. So any comparison based sorting algorithm needs n log n comparisons in the worst case. And um, well, here we don't have a notation for greater equal, but um, let me be more precise. Let's write log n factorial here to make it easier. Any comparison based sorting algorithm needs at least log n factorial comparisons in the worst case, and that is uh, tilde n log n. So we could try to squeeze that in here to make it complete. And let's see. That is the lower bound, the comparison based lower bound for sorting. And we've seen that merge sort essentially achieves this. We didn't really analyze this in detail. We analyzed the number of element excesses where uh, the constant factor was slightly different. Um, if you revisit the analysis and look at the number of comparisons you do in a merging step, uh, that's, a, that's linear in the size of the output of the merge. And uh, hence, um, we, get, we get this bound for merge sort. And so uh, merge sort is an asymptotically comparison optimal algorithm, even with the right leading constant. Uh, what's less clear is about these low order terms. Um, you can actually do with a good deal less than n log n comparisons. You could, in principle, go down to something like n log n minus 1.4 n. And uh, it's a long standing open problem in computer science whether you can do, whether you can find a sorting algorithm that achieves this asymptotic number of comparisons in the worst case. Uh, there's essentially been no progress since the early 60s on this question. Uh, with some very recent attempts, uh, which haven't fully been uh, reviewed yet. But uh, yeah, this is, as of yet, it's, a, it's an open standing problem in, in the theory of the problem. I want to briefly see if uh, you were following this. And so to test your understanding about the, um, the concept of decision trees, uh, let's do this question. And um, I probably should show you this uh, slide so that you can compare with this. So the question is, um, just for this input size, 
is this a, a tree that's best possible in the worst case or is there any way we can sort three elements uh, more efficiently? So uh, let's see what you think. Okay, results are trickling in. Maybe time to switch to uh, that screen. Okay. We were at 39 for the first question, so maybe I'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Okay, because it's so clear cut, um, you should see the results now. Yep. So there's a, a large uh, fraction of you who are saying, yes, this is optimal and uh, this is correct. And the reason for that is, well, um, we have to uh, look at the number of leaves. There are six leaves in this case. So we take the logarithm of that. That's a number between two and three. We can't really do sorting with two and a half comparisons in the worst case, that won't work. So the best we can do is round up. And uh, that means three comparisons are necessary to sort uh, three elements. And uh, this algorithm also shows that this is sufficient because this is one way to do it. There are others uh, which are equally good. So yes, um, this is an example of an optimal worst case optimal sorting method for three elements. With that exciting statement, uh, I'll, con I'll conclude the section on the lower bound. All right. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on before we jump to the next thing is I had this poll open about uh, breaks in lectures. So uh, maybe I can briefly show this here. Uh, it might be a bit small to read, but basically what's what it's saying is, uh, should we have an explicit break during lectures? Either no or two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, or several short ones. There seems to be a peak for one break around three to five minutes, um, but point taken, people's uh, preferences differ quite a bit. So um, no matter what we do, uh, not everyone will be happy with that um, decision. But I think I'll, I'll just skip to what we did before, uh, do one break at a convenient point in time uh, for maybe we can stretch it to five minutes instead of three. And uh, I restrict the amount of talking in that time of it. Uh, that sounds sounds reasonable, I think. Uh, this is a theory class and it can be challenging to follow along. So um, uh, it's, it's useful to have a little break in between. But uh, I feel it's a bit too early for now. So uh, let's, let's move on. Good. In the next subsection, I want to look at how to sort integers. And this topic is particularly important because we just talked about a lower bound for sorting for comparison based methods, which said we cannot possibly do better than uh, n log n in the worst case. And now I'll show you how you can beat this lower bound nevertheless. Uh, and this is um, another way to understand lower bounds. They uh, tell you what you can do to crack the problem in maybe even a better time. So we've, we've, seen, we've seen this lower bound of n log n comparisons. And that, of course, also means n log n running time because we have to execute these comparisons. Uh, but does that mean sorting always takes that time? And the answer is, is not necessarily because it only applies to the comparison model. And if your algorithm is not in that model, who knows what's possible? And in, indeed, lower bounds can be seen as a, as a pointer to what do you have to change 
in the description of the problem or the description of the algorithms to make it at least thinkable to get faster algorithms. And that's another um, useful thing uh, about lower bounds. They pinpoint uh, to the bottlenecks, in a sense, in, in a problem. So here, um, let's suppose we're not sorting arbitrary objects, um, but let's suppose we sort integers. So these are numbers, and we can do a lot more with integers than comparing them. We can add them up, we can compute averages, we can do all sorts of fancy uh, arithmetic operations. Now, um, in, in particular, we can do the bit tricks that the word RAM allows. So this is um, something I, I, I've mentioned when we discussed the model. You can um, do all sorts of, of weird things. Um, I'm not really going into the into details here, so uh, maybe let's just leave it with that general comment. We're definitely not working in the comparison model if we um, start computing with these integers. So uh, the lower bound formally doesn't apply. This doesn't say you can do it better, but it says you might be able to do better. A priori, it might seem unclear how arithmetic and arithmetic operations on integers should help for sorting. Um, and in a sense, yes, the arithmetic operations are not what helps us, uh, but something else uh, helps. And uh, so here's uh, the, the algorithm that will eventually solve this. Um, it's called counting sort, and I bet some of you have seen this before. Uh, but I want to go through it um, in slow-mo because it's, um, for one, it's a really beautiful thing to understand and appreciate this. Uh, and it's also something that we will use as a black box later in this class for uh, something different. So if you're sorting integers, it seems natural that uh, it's, it's important to know how big these numbers are. And uh, remember computers, so what I mean is uh, the numbers are encoded in binary. So uh, what we really ask is, what is the number of bits we need to write down the numbers that we sort? And uh, a reasonable assumption is to say all our integers come from a range 0 up to u, and u is a power of 2, so well, uh, up to u minus 1, and u is a power of 2, then these are exactly the b bit positive integers, non-negative integers. That's natural, and in this, in this setting, we can actually sort in linear time, in time theta of n plus u, and n is the number of integers. That is uh, often linear time, and theta u space, when there's a condition attached to this here, uh, when b is at most w. So when the number of bits we need for a single integer, to write down a single integer is at most the word size. I bet you've seen, many of you have seen counting sort, um, but maybe not with the stress of word RAM and word size. So if you've seen this before, carefully think about the limitations that it has and um, whether or not uh, you were aware of these. When I first saw the whole theory of sorting, I found this very puzzling. And only when I saw the word RAM, it became clear that this makes sense and is, is uh, consistent in itself. But how does uh, counting sort work now? Uh, it's a very simple algorithm. Um, you get the array of numbers. These are in, in this range. And um, what you do is you take a new array that has indices from 0 up to u. So essentially the entire range of your numbers. And that's the counter array. You initialize that to 0, and then you go through your input and set the counter at the position of this element. So you use the element in the array A, the numbers that we're sorting, as index in the array C. And that's a fancy way of saying uh, determine how often each value occurs. That's just this. And once we have the counters, we can produce a sorted list of these numbers by just uh, producing as many copies of each number as we have in the counts. That's what the second loop does. Um, uh, but there's no, um, there's no magic going on, really. 
So uh, the code is not, not too interesting. Uh, what is interesting is how does this avoid the lower bound? So I um, should probably analyze the running time briefly to see what it, how long it takes. So uh, initializing the array with all zeros, um, that takes uh, time linear in the length of the array. Then here we have a for loop. Each of the bodies is constant time because we're on the word ramp. We can do uh, read and write to memory with uh, the register content. So we load AI into a register, use that to access that memory cell. And then we execute this, well, how often? N times. So in total, it's theta n. And then the, the final loop, we do two uh, iterations, but look at what happens. Uh, for each um, value in the universe, we iterate through our counts. So this has u iterations. This has number of copies. But if we sum this all up over all uh, values for k, so this is uh, c k, but those two together, um, the summation of all the ck must be n again because we started with n numbers and these are counters. And then again, producing the output here is just constant time. So in total, this loop just takes theta n plus u time. So that's precisely uh, our claimed running time. And let's uh, Let's briefly um, see, this is less than n log n if u is not too big. Um, how is this possible? How does this algorithm circumvent the comparison-based lower bound? Well, the key thing is this line where it uses the integers as array index. That's an operation that's totally fine on the word RAM, that's totally fine on our actual computers. Uh, but the comparison-based model doesn't allow this. The takeaway from this slide is, is this box down here. Um, that's what we will use as a black box later in the class. If we're given n integers from a range, then we can sort it in... Uh, and the range is, is linear in n, then we can sort in linear time. That is not, uh, not beating the lower bound in the sense that the lower bound is wrong. It means the lower bound doesn't apply to this algorithm because it only applies to comparison-based sorting methods and this one just isn't comparison-based. All right, um, I wanted to point out that something very similar to this is used in the Java library for um, sorting byte arrays. It's not used for integers. Um, uh, uh, for integers, we use, they use uh, a quick sort variant. And if you want to learn more about what exactly that variant does, then check out the Campus Wire post and my video on that. But if you uh, sort um, a byte array, then it's essentially something like this count sort, counting sort um, that is used. There was a question um, on, on the analysis. Uh, don't we calculate C of K in the outermost cycle? So let's um, not sure where, where that applies. It's probably about the about this loop here, I guess. We compute C of K here, but we compute it by iterating, by, by incrementing it one at a time. Now in this loop here, um, we iterate through this loop one or zero times, zero times if C of K is zero, and then we don't execute this at all. So the question is how often is, is this statement executed? Each execution takes constant time and it's executed C K times for each K. And that sums up to n. So it's it's executed n times. 
the plus u comes from this first line because we have to iterate uh, through this uh, through all possible numbers even if we then don't do anything with it we still have to visit every number um, I hope that answers the question otherwise um, uh, raise it again counting sort is not the end of the story for sorting integers um, you can push the idea a little further, uh, and that's called radix sort. Uh, that is essentially doing counting sort, but not on the full universe, but only part of it, and then um, recursing. But uh, I don't want to spend more time on this, and we don't need this for this class. But it's worth knowing that even if the range is uh, polynomial in n, n to a fixed power, you can essentially apply the same idea by iterating a constant number of times and you still get linear time sorting then. That's still a very, very restricted uh, world that the integers are fairly small, bounded in terms of the length of the array or at least polynomial in the length of the array. From the theory side, and uh, um, I'm just saying this up front, so this is uh, not in the exam, uh, this is just for your curiosity. This is uh, cutting edge research on sorting. Um, I want to briefly mention this because we're a, we're a master's class um, and not just undergrads algorithms. Uh, you should be able to look a little bit beyond what's in textbooks. Uh, if we fix the size of our numbers to the word size, so we use w bit integers and sort those. And we allow that w is an arbitrary function of n. So remember, um, in unit 1, we essentially fixed w as theta log n. Now, uh, in, in general, this is not necessarily the case. You can have any other function for uh, w as a function of n. And in theory, people have looked at this. And it turns out there's different ranges. If, if w is indeed uh, not too big, like our assumption, then we can sort in linear time. We can sort n integers in linear time in this model using what I've just shown. On the opposite side, if w is very big, um, not just logarithmic, but at least more than a uh, logarithm of n squared, uh, it's a, a technical reason why this is necessary. So this means there is a positive epsilon, some, some constant greater than zero. So that w is omega of log 2 plus epsilon n. Uh, then you can again sort in linear time, but with a different sorting algorithm. And for the range in between, it's an open problem. We don't know. There is a, a very complicated algorithm with this obscure running time n times square root of log of log of n. Uh, that uses hashing and randomization uh, in a lot of advanced techniques. But we have no idea if this is best possible. Um, I think up to now, we don't know if, if linear time is the, the right answer, like in the other cases, or if there is indeed a weird range for w in between where this is not possible asymptotically. For the rest of this unit, though, uh, you can forget about this part. Um, what you need to take from this subsection is really uh, this, this uh, box down here. And the general gist from this, um, that there is a little bit more to sorting than the comparison-based model. Uh, but both for practical applications and for the rest of the theoretical topics, we will restrict ourselves to the comparison model in this unit. Uh, to wrap up, I have a last question to see uh, if you're mastering these kinds of uh, considerations. So this is, this is a mean question because I ask you to select all, um, all the answers that are correct, not just a single one. Uh, and the statement is, my computer, uh, I mean, this is literally true for this laptop and most of our other computers, yes, 60-bit words, so w is uh, 64. 
So if I use an int, say in Java or in C, it has 64 bits. It's an integer of 64 bits and say unsigned. So uh, does that mean I can sort an int array of length n in this time? Um, let's see what you have to say about this. Um, I'm very curious and uh, want to give you a minute to, to do this. I think uh, after this subsection, it's uh, a good time also to do our little break. Okay, let me switch to the poll, but I don't want to show the answers just yet. Honestly, at least 30 people answering. One more. We're, at, we're stuck at 29. Okay, something moved, but someone was just modifying their results. Aha, okay. Good, let me, let me show uh, the results now. And um, so uh, we have a lot of people saying that we can sort in n log n time. And that's, that's the easiest one. That is definitely correct, uh, because we can use a method like merge sort and then we can sort an arbitrary collection of n objects in n log n time. It doesn't even matter that these are uh, integers or ints, 64-bit um, integers in our sense. So this is definitely true. The more interesting ones are clearly the first two. Uh, constant time is, is probably clear that this is, uh, this is too ambitious. If the length of the array is unrestricted, I cannot even read the input in, in that time. So uh, this, is, this is not true. Um, but maybe also the last answer is true. And let me show you uh, what I marked as correct and uh, I want to discuss this briefly. I marked three answers correct and this is uh, partly inconsistent and I want to explain why. We talked about the answer C, that's definitely correct uh, and you could just use merge sort. So that one's that one's easy. Um, the order n time, that's a tricky one. What we can do is theta n plus u. This is counting sort. Now, if u is actually 2 to the 64, that is the same as theta n because it's plus a constant and a constant uh, is never bigger than n. So in terms of theta classes, we can do it in order n time. And that of course also implies we can do it in n log n time. Now it's not true that we can do it in time proportional to n unless we allow this constant of proportionality to be uh, arbitrarily big or to depend on, on the 64 bit. In a sense, this is uh, okay. Uh, I mean, depends on, on how, how you read it. What, depends on what you define proportional to mean. Um, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have marked it as wrong uh, because it's arguably similar to O of n. Uh, but the point is that we need this plus uh, u in either way. And whatever you say, it has to allow this plus u. That's the, the key point. And the last point also has some truth in it uh, because we can only do the, um, the faster sort than the merge sort if we have extra space and not just length and extra space. But uh, we need theta u space for counting sort. Uh, and even if we go to radix sort, um, it's not clear if we can make the space um, 
just depend on n. Suppose n is very, very small. Uh, maybe n is just 10, but the numbers are, are really big and you just have these, these 10 cells. It's not clear if you can uh, sort this in, in time that only depends on n. So all of the answers here have some merit to it. Again, instead of uh, arguing which of the answers are precisely true or not, what you should keep in mind is, is the red box. You can do counting sort, you can sort in linear time, but uh, linear in n and the universe size. With slide, trick, slide tricks possible, with radix sort, etc. But you usually don't get easily away from the plus u entirely. With that word of caution, I want to close this uh, section on integer sorting. And I think um, we take this as a moment of a break and we continue at 11.57. Um, that's five minutes according to uh, my time. And again, so that we're on the same page, let's put the, the bar next to it. Um, so uh, take a break. Uh, grab some fresh coffee or water and see you in five minutes. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, uh, this is a good time to put them in the Q&A. Then um, I'm, I'm happy to go over these after the break or during the break, depending on how relevant they are for the entire class.
All right, clock says it's 57. So let's get rid of that. There was one question about how much the class tests are worth. Um, let's briefly show this. Uh, I answered in the chat that it's basically up to how many uh, class tests there will be at the end. And I haven't entirely decided yet um, because I, I, will, I will have to see if I like all the questions that I've came up with, if they are suitable as a class test in that sense. Uh, probably 2 to 3% of the entire mark. That's a good estimate. Okay, welcome back everyone. Take a seat, stretch your arm, arms, muscles, brains, and get ready for the uh, remaining part of the lecture. I want now to open part two of the sorting unit. When we started this unit, I said it has two purposes why I want to uh, discuss sorting in detail. One, because it's, it's just a beautiful piece um, a problem that is a, a nice playground for all sorts of uh, techniques, uh, algorithmic techniques, lower bounds, and these things that we just discussed. And the second reason was that it also is a good place to learn about parallel computation and how to use many different uh, concurrent processors. And this is what the second part will be about, how we can sort with many processors. Before we get really started with this, I want to see if uh, you have used any kind of, if you have any kind of experience with uh, parallel progr programming. And let's be generous about what that really means in detail. Um, but um, most, most graphical user interface applications actually force you to use a little bit of multi-threading so I want to see if people are, have some familiarity uh, with this. And there's no reason why I wouldn't show the results for this one. So um, let's open that one. It's not that uh, we will in any way require uh, knowledge from parallel programming um, for this module. It's more uh, for me to know how much uh, is it sensible if I make comments about how are these things addressed in practice? How are these things done in programming libraries? Whereas if, uh, so it's, it looks like half-half. So if, uh, if most of you have had not seen anything like this, I would have uh, avoided some comments. But since um, a, a large fraction of you has some experience with this, it makes sense to connect the theoretical model a bit um, to the current practical programming models. This will make more sense in a second when we discuss the... Um... Okay, <laughs> well, all is wrong. Shouldn't have been there. Okay. Um, there are different types of parallel computation uh, in general, and I want to um, briefly discuss these, and we will focus uh, on, on just one of them for this class. The core thing why people get excited about parallel computation is that money can buy you time, uh, but it can buy you more computers. So if you can just rent an entire compute center and compute a challenging problem, but in parallel on all these many computers, then it might be possible to solve a problem that it otherwise would take years and would never finish in a reasonable time. If you can parallelize it to many machines, it's just a question of how much money you want to put in it. So uh, parallel computations are, are very important these days. And uh, not only because you can buy um, easily more computers, but also because we are reaching the limits, physical limits, on how much you can further compact and speed up integrated circuits. So any future um, major speedups will probably have to come from parallelization. Even the small uh, handheld devices have multiple cores. Um, so anything you do has to be parallelizable if you want to scale it up. 
that's enough of advertisement. Um, the two types of parallelism are basically shared memory parallel computers and distributed architectures. Uh, both are important and uh, both have their place in, in algorithms. Distributed computing is maybe a little less understood and therefore I'll, I'll leave it out of this discussion. Um, there are many interesting algorithms here as well, but uh, we'll focus on the shared memory parallel computer. So what do I mean by that? Again, this will eventually be a formal model of computation. Um, but uh, for now, let's just keep it a little informal. We have P processing elements. Think of these as, as processors. And they can work entirely in parallel. They communicate by reading and writing from a single shared memory. And this is, again, like in, in the RAM model, we assume that this is uh, unbounded. It can be as big as we need it. And every PE can access every cell in memory uh, using essentially the same mechanism. This is an approximation of single big servers. And these do get fairly big these days. Um, you can easily have 128 CPU cores, maybe with hyper-threading even more concurrent um, threads that are executed. And a terabyte of main memory, even though expensive, is doable. So these are really massive machines. Um, but unless you use the many cores efficiently, there's no way uh, you will make good use of that, such an expensive machine. Uh, just briefly, distributed computing is similar in that there's also P processing elements that work independently and in parallel. Uh, but they have private memory. And so they can work on their private memory but communication between processing elements is only via a defined um, interface. It can be over the network. Uh, I mean, it can be over the internet, or it can be a more specialized, faster network within a, um, a high-performance computer. Um, this is uh, up to applications. But you usually send explicit messages from processing element A to processing element B. So this is more like a cluster of uh, individual computers connected by a network. Again, we'll focus on, on shared memory. And um, the formal model now is the PRAM, the Parallel Random Access Machine. You know by now what the RAM is. Uh, if not, refresh your memory in unit one. Uh, what the PRAM adds to this is that there are P such processing elements, and each is essentially a RAM computer. Uh, what's important is that these, um, these individual processing elements are identified with IDs. And uh, we can use these IDs in code, and we can compute with them. So that, uh, again, it will become much clearer when you see an example. Uh, but it's important that they have an identity. Now, uh, we already had a parameter from the RAM, the word size, and now we additionally have a parameter p. So uh, for every problem, we now have three things floating around. There's the input size n, the number of uh, PEs, p, and the word size w, phew. Uh, well, we'll have to deal with it, but often we can ignore the word size for the parallel computation. It often is not the, the interesting factor. And for P, we'll find um, a different solution when we go to the work span model. But um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. What has to be kept in mind is that they all can grow with n. So having an assumption or an algorithm stated with essentially a linear number of processors is not unusual. Suppose you were sorting a list of n integers. And uh, the assumption there is you have n processors. So you're sorting a list of uh, a billion integers. There you go. Here you have a billion processors. If that sounds a bit unrealistic, we'll fix that later. This is, um, this is the, the theoretical model. There are fixes to make it useful for practical statements. We'll come to that. All of the PEs independently run a RAM-style program, and it's the same 
this is maybe um, something I, I should stress here. They, they really run the same program and uh, in lockstep, they run this synchronized. Their time is, is synchronized. All the processing elements make one step after the other, but in parallel. And uh, in this RAM program, uh, we use the ID to tell uh, what is different for the different processing elements. Um, that's that's the, the way it's usually done. And it's a, it's a convenient and concise way to do it. Uh, each of the PEs has a, an own copy of registers, but mem is shared among all uh, processing elements. That's the, the shared memory model. And as I already said, um, they run in synchronous, uh, in synchronous steps. OK, um, the, the assumption that they run the same RAM style program, because they can use their ID to branch off into different parts, it's not, it's not really a, a big restriction. So this, this looks like they have to go in lockstep and execute the very same thing all the time. But because you can use the ID, this is not true. So that's the, that's the model, um, the RAM model. If, again, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. I'm throwing a lot of definitions at you today. And I hope um, it will later become clear uh, how these affect things. And we'll discuss some of this more in the tutorials. Uh, we'll next talk about uh, conflict management. But I first want to um, stress on this slide. Uh, this sounds all great. So they all independently run their operations. And if, if this processing element adds two numbers in its registers and this adds two other numbers in its registers, uh, nothing bad happens. The only complicated part is what happens if different several processing elements concurrently read and write the same memory cell. This is where things get complicated. And this is also where things in practice uh, get, well, either wrong or slow, or you have to make something um, sophisticated. Uh, in the PRAM, there's different versions of conflict management. What happens if you access the same memory cell? And these go from strict to more lenient. The strictest is the exclusive read, exclusive write. That means no one is ever allowed to access the same memory cell in the same time step. And if that ever happens, uh, the machine just blows up. And so you have a pro as a programmer, you have to avoid this at all costs. This is super strict and is stricter than most um, actual computers need it. So it's not used a lot, uh, but sometimes it's used uh, to, show, um, to show limits of what you can do. Uh, more flexible is the concurrent read but exclusive write model, which means it's fine if, um, if many processing elements read the same cell, because reading doesn't create conflicts. As long as the same data is written there and they read all the same value, it's, uh, it's consistent. Uh, but writing can, crea can create problems because you could write, try to write different values to the same spot, and then you have to decide what wins. So the, the crew PRAM just says, this is not allowed. Whenever you write to the same cell, it has to be a single processing element. There's no parallel uh, write access. Um, you can also go to a concurrent read and concurrent write. So you do allow several processing elements to write the same cell. But then you need, uh, you need to say what happens uh, with different values that are written to the same um, to the same cell. And there are again different models. Uh, you can assume if this happens, they must all write the very same value. So there's nothing really to, to do. Or, and uh, unfortunately, this is closer to real hardware. If several things write at the same time to the memory, uh, same memory location, some arbitrary nonsense happens. One of them, one of the writes wins. Uh, if you're unlucky and you're not writing an atomic uh, thing, it might even happen that you have a, a chimera of, of the two values, half of the first and half of the second value. So this is uh, unfortun unfortunately closest to, uh, 
to actual CPUs and memory systems. But there are ways around synchronization steps around in software to, to uh, mitigate that. Uh, but it's, um, it's fairly inconvenient to program, as you might know if you have experience with that. Uh, so these are, um, these are sometimes called race conditions. Uh, which is the big plague of all parallel programming and uh, concurrent programming. This is what programmers try to avoid at all costs, and it's it's hard to do. Um, in theory, we mostly work on the crew PRAM, so we don't allow a concurrent write access. This might seem a bit restrictive, but it really means we restrict the algorithms that we allow. And if you look at the practical solutions uh, for, for concurrent programming, they actually try to do uh, software tricks to come closer to this. So it's, it's a reasonable decision to focus on this one. And it means we have to take care in our algorithms that we never write to the same memory cell uh, at the same time with different processing elements. All right, uh, let me check if there's any questions. Not at the moment. Um, good. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, let, me, let me know. So we defined how uh, the machine works like. We defined what a PRAM is and how programs can execute, um, at, least, at least on a high level of abstraction. What's missing is um, the execution cost of such a program. And this used to be very simple. We said in the RAM, that the running time is just the number of steps that we execute. Now in the PRAM, this is a bit more complicated because we have these parallel uh, executions. So we have to be a little more uh, concrete, a bit, a bit more detailed. Uh, and there's now three, three things. Uh, space is same as before. It's the, the total amount of uh, main memory that we use. Uh, time here in, is meant as parallel time or make span if you want sometimes also called depth. That's the number of time steps till all parallel uh, processing elements finish. So it's uh, the maximum over all the running times of all threads, if you want. Right? That's closest to the wall clock time you as a user have to wait for the algorithm to finish. And a, a new parameter is work. That's the total number of instructions executed on all processing elements. Um, if, you're, if you're just looking at time and space, then work looks uh, less interesting, but it will become interesting for two reasons. Um, one, because we don't usually have a billion of processors around, and then work will become a, a, a important. And the second thing is work might be seen as uh, proportional to the consumed energy, and uh, you do want um, energy-efficient algorithms these days. So. Uh, just going parallel indefinitely and duplicating the work many times is not acceptable. So all three are, um, are important and we have to balance them out by choosing appropriate algorithms. Uh, the holy grail in PRM algorithms, what people try to achieve is, of course, minimal time well, and space, but um, maybe that's a bit less of a, a focus. But also you want that work of your parallel algorithm is no worse than the running time of the best sequential algorithm. Okay. Uh, the running time of the best sequential algorithm. For sequential algorithms, work in time is the same. Uh, this is maybe a obvious comment, but I just want to make this here. Uh, so you, you try to find something that doesn't produce, uh, that doesn't do much more work overall, at least same theta class. Uh, then we call an algorithm work efficient. A parallel algorithm is work efficient if it's in the same theta class as the best sequential in terms of work. Uh, but at the same time, it hopefully achieves a good speed up in terms of parallel computation time. Okay, um, I want to briefly see if you are following along on this. So a little innocent question, is every computational problem solvable with a work-efficient algorithm? 
Let's see what you think about this. Okay, I'd love to see a couple more people answer on this before I give it, give it away. 23, 24. Let's do it till 30 again. Same as before. Come on guys, 26, we can do more. Okay, well, the time's running up, so maybe I'll, I'll just show them now. Uh, it's roughly, roughly half-half. And uh, so you will be interested to see the right answer. And uh, uh, the answer is yes, because um, whenever I take the sequential algorithm, we have if I have a sequential algorithm, work efficient is always with respect to a good sequential algorithm. If I take the same sequential algorithm and just declare this is my parallel algorithm, even though it only uses one uh, thread, that is work efficient. It's just a crappy parallel algorithm because it doesn't achieve any speed up. But it's work efficient uh, and you can call it parallel. It's just um, calling it parallel even though it doesn't. It's a, it's a crappy parallel algorithm. Time is bad, span is bad but uh, it's work efficient. Okay, it's a bit of a trick question. Now, Lia, raus, bitte. That's the choice of home of home working. Um, I hope we don't have too many noises. Let's move on um, to the last part of, of this introduction on the PRAM. Uh, that's a criticism that I'm, I'm sure many of you had in mind when I presented this. Uh, we don't have a billion of processors just because we're sorting a billion integers. So uh, why should I care for this uh, weird measure of uh, running time, span, and work? And the reason is that you can always simulate an algorithm that for the PRAM on uh, a particular machine that has a given number of processors p. And then what you achieve is running time t plus w of p. So t is the span of the parallel algorithm and w is its work. Then the actual time you get on this machine with p processors is t plus w divided by p. And the work stays the same up to constant factors. And so this really means um, I want to highlight this again. Uh, this really means that work is important. Uh, in theory, the time is just t, just the span. But this assumes you have an arbitrary number of processors, and you usually don't. And if you actually simulate this on a machine with p processors, you get this uh, additional contribution w over p. I think... Um, uh, I want to briefly sketch um, how this works. Um, it's it's a very simple construction. Um, as it says here, it's it's really just round robin round robin simulating uh, the PEs. And so um, let's suppose I have uh, here my PRAM algorithm. And that one has uh, potentially very many, um, many, many uh, processing elements. So time proceeds top down. And now here I have, uh, I don't know, PE0, PE1, 
one blah, 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 blah. and there can be many up to p in each time step each of these executes one uh one step maybe i can put myself over here that's time step one time step two we have another step but maybe um I think the the dots make this inconvenient. Let's let's keep it concrete and uh, maybe add one more. So uh, three and uh, four. Maybe they all execute something in the first two time steps. In the next two. It could be that some of them are actually dormant and they don't do anything. And maybe next time step, there's it's even more restricted. Only one is doing something. And then again, they all join and uh, do something useful. So this is how uh, the time progresses. That's the parallel uh, algorithm. So what we would have here is time is five because we have five time steps and the work is, well, whatever, you have to count. So that's 10, 15, I guess 19, up to uh, your instructor not being able to count. And how do we do this if we have a machine with, say, just three uh, processing elements? What we do is a round robin simulation. So in the first time step, we use our three processors that we do have to simulate the first round of the black ones. But then we need an, an additional time step to simulate those two. So these are the first three. We just schedule them in the first time step. And the remaining two follow in the next time step. Then we do the same thing for the red ones. And again, we need two time steps here to simulate that. For the blue ones, we can actually fit them all in because there's just three. And then the green is just a single one. And then the purple again needs two time steps because they're all involved. Now this clearly got more expensive, um, but how, how much more time do we really need? Uh, we need the original time step. Um, let's see if I'm, I'm running slightly out of colors here, but uh, I'll try to manage. For the, the original means we can essentially pay for the first step of each color here by uh, saying we needed that many steps already in the, in the PRAM execution. So that's the, the contribution of, of that part. And then the W divided by P pays for all the other ones. And so we have to uh, make sure that these steps don't sum up to more than W over P. But uh, we really have um, how many steps of this blue How many blue steps uh, can we have? Well, we always make sure that um, these are entirely full. Up to the last uh, round per time step. Per PRAM step. And that means uh, we add at most one. So we get this plus one as an upper bound because we make, um, we make them full as long as we can, but then we add one more for each. Um, sorry, this is a T for, uh, it's one per original time step. So how many, how many steps of the blue types do we have? Here it's, it's uh, too small an example to, to show this. But in general, if this would have been um, a much larger number of processors, uh, you would pay the first three by 
charging to the green part. And then you would have as many as there are, but divided by P by three, many more steps plus one for the last one because there could be an individual job left over. If you sum this up over all the, the T time steps, you get a contribution in total of W over P plus T for these. And uh, that extra um, summand of T just uh, vanishes in the big O notation. So uh, what this means is if we're given uh, work and span for an algorithm, we can actually estimate how long it would take to run it on a given computer with a given number of processors just from those two numbers. And we could even um, transform such an algorithm in one into one that runs on such a machine by essentially simulating uh, this proof idea in an algorithm. And um, that concludes this part on, on the model for parallel computation. And looking at the time, um, I won't have time to introduce the next topic. So uh, we continue with that um, uh, tomorrow then. OK, thanks a lot. Um, I think I'll have to skip the Zoom social, but we can uh, resume that tomorrow. And uh, I'll leave the live stream open for another minute or so. If you have questions, then uh, please put them in the Q&A now. Uh, or also the Campus Wire back channel, if you wish. Um, and uh, tomorrow we'll continue. Uh, with, well, we'll continue with some actual parallel algorithms. Uh, first, for some um, toy problems, if you want, uh, it's a, a building block that doesn't seem very useful if you first see it. But then we'll see it has ample uses to parallelize our sorting algorithms. And that then will uh, bring um, our uh, sorting algorithm chapter to a close. There's one question um, about uh, this last part. It looks like you didn't use 19. You used w equals 5. Um, well, here, the work is the total number of these little boxes. That's the total work that we pay. And that's 19 here. Um, if I take the, the, I mean, okay, we can, we can compute this, this formula, but, uh, it ignores constant factors. So I think this might be, uh, why it, it, it looks far off. It's also an upper bound. Uh, this bound is, um, if you choose a, a worse example, if you always have, um, P steps that are completely full. And um, well, we have two P's, and now we reduce it to a smaller P. So that's on the that's the P RAM. Uh, say we use I don't know, capital P here and small P here. Uh, the worst occurs if this P divided little p. Uh, if that if that large p is the small p and it's just one left over. K times the small p plus one. Then you always get um, k full steps where you use p. So you get this k times, and then there's a single one left uh, alone. And then the the green steps is the first of these, and we get k minus one of the blue plus one. So it's in total again k of the blue steps, and so that works out to be 
sorry, that works out to be exactly w divided p, because w on that side would be the time times p. We use uh, that many um, processors all the time. And then if, if we insert that, so that no, that's a different P, unfortunately. Now we have to use that fact. So we back it at the beginning. It's, uh, it's more useful to keep it like that. The W over P. And then you really get the number of blue steps is W over P and the number of green steps is T. So the example was a bit too small um, to see the full uh, contribution that the blue part can have. I don't know if that um, helps helps under answering the question. Any, any other questions? Um, otherwise, uh, see you guys tomorrow. Okay, doesn't seem there are more questions. So uh, take care and see you tomorrow, same, same time. Uh, think of doing the class test, even though there's uh, still plenty of time. Uh, do work on the tutorial problems before the session tomorrow to get, um, get the most out of these. They will focus on the first part of the sorting unit. So we're we long covered um, everything that we need for that. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.